welcome, welcome everyone. Thank y'all so much for joining us tonight. We are so excited to have y'all here. Um, as a reminder, you are more than welcome to have cameras on, cameras off, whatever feels comfy. We just ask that you stay muted until we get to our Q&A section at the end. And by all means, feel free to put questions in the chat. Abby and Abby, two Abbies, <laughs> will be managing the chat for you, and we can make sure that all your questions are answered, um, and we'll have a QA and a portion at the end to just close everything off and make sure that whatever's on your mind is addressed, so feel free to take notes and keep those questions for the end or pop them in the chat whenever you feel comfortable. To kick things off, I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Abby Griffith. I'm the owner and founder of Clarity Fitness. We're Georgia's first weight-inclusive eating disorder-informed fitness center in the downtown Decatur Square, and we facilitate joyful movement in a safe space so that people can see that they're enough as they are, and we have really gotten so excited about this presentation tonight. Abby, our intern, has been incredible, and this is her capstone project with us, so it's been a super, super speedy eight weeks, but she has done an amazing job. And uh, this will be her final presentation again for her time with us. And then we'll be moving into next chapters, bringing her onto the team in a few weeks. I also, before we get started, I know last announcement, uh, wanted to make sure that everyone knew that we have a new offer called Clarity Online, which is a really, really incredible fitness platform for you delivered straight to your home. For just $99 down, you get access to all 30 of our pre-recorded fitness classes, and this is access for life. So it's not another subscription. It's just a one-time investment for all different links and all different types of fitness classes. We have different classes that have been brought to you by physical therapists, by personal trainers, things on shoulder mobility and stability, classes you can do without breaking a sweat, little intro introductions to movement while you're at work, lots of different fun resources. And if you sign up for Clarity Online tonight, you can actually get 20% off your order with our code STORY, as Abby's presentation is titled STORY20. And I will be putting all of that information in the chat in just a bit. Um, but without further ado, I want to pass the mic over to our fellow Abby and just again, thank her so much for her time with us and wish you all the best. You will be amazing in this presentation and I'm just a chat away if you need anything. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Abby. And thanks everyone for being here. Um, so for the next hour or so, I'm going to be talking about navigating changes in physical ability. Um, and before I start off, I just want to say, um, like Abby said, I think Clarity is a super inclusive community. Verbiage is a big thing. Um, so if I say anything that you disagree with or wish I had worded differently, or even if your understanding of a concept is different than what I talk about, please feel free to share that. Um, I want this to be a safe space where people can share any thoughts. Um, so feel free to put anything either in the chat or raise your hand or interrupt me. Um, yeah, so feel free to do that if anything comes up. So my plan for the next hour is to talk about my story and why this topic of figuring out how to navigate changes in ability is important to me. Um, and then I'll go into some other people's experiences that I've seen both in my education and in my work that relate to this topic. Um, and then I'll jump into some of the longer term changes in ability that affect both day to day activities and then also um, structured fitness and performance goals and then some short-term fluctuations in ability. Those are a little bit more specific to performance goals and structured fitness. Um, and then at the end, I'll go into some coping strategies and advice that I have based on my experience. All of those are backed by data, but I do wanna say, again, those are my experience. They're not gonna be universal. Unfortunately, they're not you know, a one-stop shop, one -stop shop to, to fix all of that and help make navigating changes in ability super easy but hopefully that will help um, give you an idea of what might work for you. So this topic is super important to me because when I was growing up, I was super active. That's me in the left-hand corner. Um, when I started playing soccer, um, I was super young and that was a very big part of my childhood. Um, my parents are here. I'm sure they could attest that I was a very um, active child to say the least. Um, 
this is me and my flag football team in high school that I did a few seasons of. Um, so that was all very important to me growing up, especially as I started playing sports more competitively. I really pushed myself. I had a lot of coaches who were very adamant on working your best, giving your all at every single practice and not taking a step back. Um, one thing that one of my coaches said that really stuck with me was every day you spend off the field, one of your competitors is on the field getting better. Um, I think anyone who grew up playing sports competitively may have heard that. Um, it's something that I think a lot of us hear pretty frequently. And I didn't realize at the time how harmful that mentality is because rest days are super important. Listening to your body and working with your body are super important. Um, so it took me a really long time to figure out that that wasn't a healthy way of doing fitness. Another quote that I really internalized at the time when I was playing my sports pretty competitively was um, by a super cool guy named Louis Zamperini. He's a World War II prisoner of war and he was an Olympian. He's incredible. I highly recommend reading his book. But one of his quotes is, a moment of pain is worth a lifetime of glory. Um, I loved that quote. I thought about it all the time, especially when I was running. If I was in a lot of pain, I would think about that quote and be like, okay, I just need to get through this. Even though I'm hurting or tired, as soon as I finish this, it'll pay off. Um, I was talking to Abby about this. I even thought about getting a tattoo of that quote, which I'm really glad that I didn't now because I realized that as amazing as he is, that quote isn't always the best in terms of healthy movement. Um, and me internalizing both that quote and the idea of needing to give 100% at all times, both ended up leading me to developing a pretty significant injury when I was 15 years old. Um, and that ended up leading into a diagnosis of a condition called complex regional pain syndrome a few years after that initial injury. Um, and this condition that I was diagnosed with is characterized by pretty intense burning pain, swelling, temperature, and color changes in my um, affected limb and motor dysfunction. And this diagnosis and the injury that I had that led to the diagnosis um, pretty significantly changed my physical ability. Looking back, it wasn't overnight, but that's how it felt. I was used to being able to move my body in one way. And then all of a sudden, I was not only unable to move in that way that I was able to move before, but I was also having difficulty doing things like getting out of bed or walking to class or even sitting still in a classroom attending school. Um, all of those things became super challenging for me. And I think I got into a little bit of a negative cycle of saying, okay, I can't do all these things I used to be able to do. There's no point in trying to figure out how to, to navigate that and figure out how to move within my new limitations. Um, and it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I really took hold of that and said, I want to rewrite my story and I want to be able to do these things and figure out ways to not necessarily do everything I was able to do before, um, but work with my body instead of pushing against it. Um, sorry, I just saw something that was put in the chat um, that said that um, their high school was the same way. Um, I think it's a pretty universal feeling that a lot of people experience, unfortunately. And I think it's something that places like Clarity are trying to, to help with as well. Um, so once I decided that it was time to rewrite my story and figure out how to work with my body, um, I started setting new goals for myself and taking it one day at a time and figuring out how to navigate my change in ability to allow me to do things that I once loved, even if that looked differently than it did before. So here are some photos of me since I kind of started that journey of navigating my change in ability. Um, since then, I've been able to participate in fitness classes and go on hikes um, and coach a little girls running team. And these are all things that I didn't think I'd be able to do even a few years ago. Um, but figuring out how to work with my body and listen to my body has allowed me to get back to some of the things that I really love. Um, I saw that same theme of being super frustrated with navigating changes in ability a ton, both in my education and in my job. Um, my senior year of college, I did a capstone in one of my classes 
where I worked with different interlocutors to create visual representations of various conditions and diseases and illnesses and put that all together onto a website um, called the Online Unity Quilt. Um, so with each piece of art that I created with people, we talked about their stories and have a little excerpt on that with each piece of art. But one of the common themes I noticed while working with the interlocutors on this project was that people expressed the frustration and loneliness that they felt in dealing with changes in ability, um, especially for things that were on set later. One of the big things that I noticed was just feeling like they were so isolated in that experience, but everyone was saying the same thing of, this is such a lonely thing to navigate a change in ability. So that's another reason why I'm here today is because I want to um, shed light on the fact that a lot of people are going through frustrations with changes in ability, both on a large scale, but also on a smaller day-to-day -day scale. So some of the longer term changes in ability that I'm going to talk about today are seasonal changes, which are completely normal. That's one I hadn't really thought of um, before, but people have fluctuations in their physical ability throughout the year. That's completely natural and normal. Um, injury, illness, and aging are also pretty significant um, life events that can lead to changes in ability. Um, and before I go into all of these, I um, just want to invite you to be mindful of anything that these might bring up for you, any thoughts or feelings. I know sometimes it can be frustrating, especially if you relate to one of these. Um, so feel free to journal or reflect on them if any of these bring up any feelings for you. Um, and also maybe think about how, how our society shapes our views. I think, especially with my experience in injury, I was very hard on myself about not being able to do things that I could do before. And I think part of that is because of a societal expectation to be giving your 100% at all times. Um, so I invite you to kind of think about those factors as well as we talk about the long-term changes in ability. So seasonal changes are a big one. Like I said, they're things that I hadn't really thought about before, but climate, temperature, and daylight hours can all affect um, your physical ability throughout the year and your physical activity throughout the year. Um, in one study done by researchers, they showed that every participant involved in the study noted changes in their physical activity throughout the year and therefore their physical ability. Um, for some people, they were more active during the winter and for others, they were more active during the summer. But in general, researchers noted that darkness and cold pose barriers in the winter and in the summer, um, people were traveling more, had more flexibility with work. Um, so they were, some people were working out less in the summer. Um, this is very based on the individual. It's completely normal. And I would like to point out, I'm not mentioning this because it's something that should change. Um, it is natural. It is normal. It's going to happen to every person almost every year statistically. So um, that is one change in ability um, that can be frustrating to navigate. Another one is injury. And I know this um, image has a lot of words on it. Basically what it is summarizing is the process from initial injury all the way down to recovery. And it shows that the process of getting injured and recovering from an injury is a very long journey. Um, for me, this one was especially hard to navigate um, having a change in ability after an injury. And then even after I'd recovered from that initial injury, my physical ability still was not at the level it was at before. Currently, almost 10 years later, it's still not where it was before. And that's okay. And it's natural. Um, in one study where um, researchers looked at 77 individuals who had been injured while running, um, they noted that the median recovery time was 56 days. And that was for a bunch of different injuries that included tibial stress syndrome, Achilles tendinopathy, um, patella injuries, iliotibial band syndrome, plantar fasciitis, and a bunch of others. So in general, injuries take a long time to heal from. It's important that you allow yourself that full time to heal so that you can return to an activity safely. But that can be really frustrating because a lot of times the time that it takes to recover will end up affecting performance when you go back. Um, so that's another big one that can be frustrating to navigate. Illness is another one that kind of goes hand in hand with injury where you need time to recover and you might need to take some time off from your day-to-day -day activities that you're used to doing or your fitness activities that you're used to doing. Um, 
COVID-19 actually is a really interesting thing to look at because people who were diagnosed with COVID noted changes in their physical activity, but even people who had never had COVID-19 also had changes in their physical ability. Um, in a study that was done last year, researchers found that COVID was linked to a significant decrease in mobility, um, walking and physical activity, and general increases in sedentary activity. A lot of people, regardless of if you got sick or not during the pandemic, were not commuting to work and they were working from home and in general out of the house less, which meant that they were less physically active and therefore their ability levels changed when they got back to doing more structured activities. Um, so I think an important thing with both injury and illness is figuring out a safe way to participate in physical activity or to do your everyday tasks while still respecting your body and listening to your body. Aging is another one. This one comes up a ton in my work because I see people who um, express frustration with not being able to do things that they could once do when they were a lot younger. Um, the World Health Organization defines intrinsic capacity as the composite of all physical and mental capacities that an individual can draw on. And that is um, shaped by your genetic background, chronic diseases, lifestyle, natural changes that everyone will experience while aging, um, and your broader, broader genetic background. Um, and your intrinsic capacity starts to decline at a constant rate of about 1% per year after the maturity process is complete, which is generally around 25 years of age. Um, that'll change a little bit based on the individual. Um, aging is natural, it's normal. No one, well, maybe some people enjoy it. I think generally society says, you know, we don't enjoy it, but I think it's important to kind of reframe that and remember that while sometimes we have changes in ability related to aging, there are also a lot of beautiful things that come with aging and maybe reframing some of that mindset can help with navigating that, um, which I'll touch on a little bit more as we get into planning. Um, some of the short-term fluctuations that I'm going to talk about are hormonal changes, job and school stress, sleep, work capacity, familial obligations, and finding balance between fitness and your general life. Um, all of these short-term fluctuations are more geared towards structured physical activity, whatever that looks like for you. Um, they can be applicable to your daily lifestyle things, but very generally, they're more targeted towards structured physical activity. Um, the first one is hormonal changes, and this is more specific for people who experience periods. Um, if you don't experience a period, your hormonal changes are a little bit less significant. They don't fluctuate as much. But for those who do experience periods, your hormones are changing a ton throughout your cycle. So a cycle has four stages. The first stage is the menstrual phase of your cycle, and that's generally days zero to seven. Depends on the individual. It'll fluctuate based on the month. But in that first stage of your cycle, all of your hormones like um, estrogen, progesterone, luteinizing hormone, and follicle stimulating hormone are all super low, which means that your energy levels are super low. Um, the next stage in a menstrual cycle is the follicular phase, which is days 8 to 13, which is when estrogen starts to build and subsequently your energy starts increasing as well. Then you hit ovulation, that's usually around day 14 or 15. And that's when all of your hormones are super high and it's a great time for um, having a ton of energy, a great time to start hitting PRs or things like that if you have performance-based goals. And then the luteal phase is days 16 to 28 as your body's kind of preparing to um, go back and start a new cycle. And in that phase, progesterone is building. Um, and the different hormones that are at play at different stages of a menstrual cycle um, kind of translate to different types of optimal training. You can do any type of training at any stage. And I do want to say here that there are, um, this is a relatively newer topic in scientific literature. So a lot of this is backed by perceived benefits, not hard data. Um, but I think a lot of people who experience periods might notice this, um, these trends where different types of activities are optimized during different stages. So during the menstrual cycle or the menstrual phase of the cycle where your energy is super low, 
um, it might be best to do things that are lower impact or lower volume. That might be what your hormones are supporting the most. Um, things like walking or stretching um, might feel the best during that part of your menstrual cycle. During the follicular phase, as your energy is starting to build because of hormones, endurance training will feel a lot better. And then when you hit ovulation, like I said, that's a great time to go for PR. A PR, that's when your energy is the highest. Um, so that's great for things like HIIT training or strength and power training. Um, and then the luteal phase as progesterone is building, that's a great time for lower impact recovery activities, things like aerobic work and Pilates and yoga and swimming, things like that. Um, with all of this, I think the biggest thing is listening to your body and figuring out what feels best for you at different stages. These are kind of general perceived things that a ton of um, data has been collected to show, but it's not necessarily going to be true for every single individual. Um, in one study of 140 competitive endurance athletes, I believe they were biathlon and cross-country skiers, um, researchers found that the participants noticed perceived changes in their fitness throughout their cycles. And these were specifically endurance athletes, and they noticed that their endurance fitness was the lowest during their menstrual phase and the highest during their follicular phase, which if you look back and figure out what your hormones are doing at those stages, the follicular phase is kind of optimized for endurance training. So that goes along with what the athletes in this study noted. Um, another thing that will cause changes in your physical activity or physical ability and performance goals on a day-to-day -day basis is job and school stress. Um, cortisol, which is one of the main stress hormones, is important, especially for physical activity. Um, it can be beneficial for alertness and can also actually improve performance. But when you get into levels of chronic stress, then you can start seeing adverse effects, especially when it comes to fitness. Um, in a meta-analysis of 168 studies, researchers showed an inverse association between stress and physical activity. There were some studies within that meta-analysis that showed an increase in physical activity with stress, um, possibly as a coping mechanism, but the majority of those studies showed that higher stress was associated with less exercise or less physical activity, um, which if you're less physically active, your physical abilities are also going to end up changing. Um, so that kind of plays into the long-term effects as well. But even on a short-term note, if you have a day where you're a little bit more stressed with whatever's going on in life, that could impact your performance goals on that specific day. Sleep is another super important one. Um, studies have shown that sleep negatively affects your anaerobic power, speed and power endurance, high-intensity interval training, strength endurance, strength-based endurance, and skill. Um, and researchers kind of set that point for when you start seeing adverse effects from lack of sleep at six hours per night. That's a very general um, guideline that will change based on the individual. If you're someone who tends to sleep more, you're going to start seeing those adverse um, effects from sleep loss at a higher point than those six hours. If you don't need as much sleep because that's how your body functions, then it might be lower for you. But in general, sleep is a very important aspect when it comes to, to fitness um, and is especially important to think about when talking about safe fitness. Um, John, I hope you don't mind me talking about this, but in one of our sessions, we um, went over to the squat rack and I said, okay, John, this is the amount of weight that you squatted last time we did a leg day. Does this sound good for today? Here's the plan. And he was like, okay, well, I actually didn't sleep super well last night, so we might need to adjust. And I'm so happy he said that. That's exactly the right response because it, he was making sure that he was doing a safe workout and listening to his body and figuring out what was best for him on that given day, especially knowing that he had um, not slept as much, which could impact performance. And John is John. So we ended up doing more than he anticipated. But in general, it's great to listen to your body and be able to communicate that and know both for yourself and also if you're working out with other people to have that be something that you're conscious of in that setting as well. Um, work capacity is another thing that can change your physical ability on a day-to-day -day basis. Your body can only do so much. I feel like we all kind of say like, oh, I wish a day was longer than 24 hours. I wish I you know, could do more. But at the end of the day, a day is 24 hours. 
And energy works the same way. Your body only has so much energy to use. Um, you can only perform a certain amount of work, recover from that work, and then pos positively adapt to it um, before you start seeing adverse effects. So if you have a day where you're a lot busier at work or you moved a lot more on that day than normal, you might not be able to work out to the same level that you're used to being able to work out at. It's completely normal. Even if you did more work yesterday than you normally do, that could impact your workout today. Um, so I think that's another one to be super conscious of and be lenient with yourself about. Um, another one is familial obligations. This can all take away time from structured fitness. Things like cooking and cleaning and errands, which some people find fun, I personally don't. Um, those can all take away time from the gym, which can impact your performance when you go back to the gym. These are completely like normal. You should spend time cooking and cleaning and doing errands. They're all important, arguably more important than fitness, depending on the day and what your goals are. So um, this is kind of a reminder that these should be prioritized as well. Um, and that it's okay if your performance goals need to be put on hold for a sec to take care of other obligations that you have. On that same note, finding balance within your life is super important. Nobody should have their focus be fitness 24-7 or performance goals 24-7. You also need time for travel and hanging out with friends and catching up on work um, and rest days, especially. For me, that was one of the reasons why I end up getting my injury in the first place and having that change in ability, um, respecting your body, listening to your body and working within your realm of capability is super important. Um, again, more important than fitness or structured fitness. So now that I touched on all of those, both longer and shorter term causes for fluctuation in your physical ability, um, I'm going to throw out some coping strategies that worked for me. I talked about it earlier, but this is not an exhaustive list and it's not necessarily going to fix all of the frustration or whatever feelings you may be feeling. Um, these are just things that in my experience have been helpful and that um, data kind of supports for helping navigate changes in ability. So strategies that I'm gonna go into are adaptive goal setting, regaining and maintaining motivation, predicting barriers in advance and then being able to plan for them and then seeking support. So the first one is adaptive goal setting. And with this, it's important to make sure that the goals you're setting for yourself, whether they're goals in your day-to-day -day life or goals that are related to structured fitness, um, making sure that those goals are realistic and adaptable. I think one of my big things before my injury was that my goals were very lofty. They were very performance-based and I didn't leave a lot of room for um, flexibility. And then when I had my injury and later my diagnosis, I wanted to be able to meet those same goals and I wasn't adjusting based on my new level of ability, um, which was extremely frustrating. And like I said earlier, kind of put me in a negative cycle of, okay, I can't do this. So maybe there's no point in trying, which once I got out of that mentality was super helpful to kind of help me rewrite my story. But if my goals had been a little bit more realistic for my capabilities, and if I'd been willing to be flexible, I might've gotten to that point a little bit sooner. So I think these are very important. Um, celebrating both big and small achievements is also important. I think sometimes we get caught up in thinking that our goals need to be super lofty when they don't need to be. It's okay for goals to be things like, I wanna get out of bed today, or I want to walk to class. Like that might not be a goal for everyone, but that is a goal that's worth celebrating. Um, and then SMART goals. I know people have a love-hate relationship with SMART goals. If you know about them, I feel like they come up a lot in my life and in my education, but they're goals that are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timed. Um, basically, the idea behind SMART goals is making sure that your goals are flexible and able to be met. Um, and I think being adaptable is another part um, that can help. Um, another thing that I want to point out is that there are multiple types of goals. Um, process goals and outcome goals are two categories of goals. And I think process goals align a little bit more with intentions, whereas outcome goals are a little bit closer to how we traditionally think of goals. 
Um, process goals are more long-term. They're very habit-oriented and focus on the journey of achieving that goal more so than the final product. Um, they have a rigid routine, but the product is flexible and success in process goals looks like continuing to grow and change and adapt. Um, whereas outcome goals are shorter term, they're very project oriented and focus on the destination. It doesn't necessarily matter how you get to that destination, as long as you get there, that's the goal. And success with outcome goals looks like finishing and completing that goal. So an example of an outcome goal is I want to finish a race. That it doesn't matter how you finish it. It doesn't matter what you do to be able to finish the race, but as long as you finish it, that's achievement with an outcome goal. Whereas a process goal might look like I want to move my body every day, or I want to be respectful towards my body every day. And that focus is on the journey. It's okay if there are bumps on the road to getting there. Um, and for me, I think shifting more of my goals towards process goals was super helpful as I navigated changes in ability, just allowing myself to be more patient with myself and my limitations, and then not feeling defeated if I didn't meet a goal, which is how I felt when I didn't meet outcome goals before. Um, I do think they're both important, um, but figuring out a balance that works best for you in terms of how many of your goals are process goals and how many of your goals are outcome goals. Um, Another thing for me that was especially frustrating when navigating a change in ability was that I really didn't have the motivation to figure out how to cope with what was going on with my body. And especially with my goals being very performance-based goals and very lofty goals, when I wasn't meeting them, I was feeling frustrated and then had trouble getting myself to move my body in a healthy way. And for me, one of the biggest things that helped me regain motivation to figure out how to work with my body was remembering that fitness is more than just those performance-based goals, like being able to run a mile in X amount of minutes. And instead of thinking like that, I started focusing on fitness helping me um, in other aspects, like contributing to my brain health and reducing the risk of disease and managing my own medical condition. It can strengthen bones and muscles and improve for your um, ability on day-to-day -day tasks, and it helps you feel better. Fitness um, is pretty known to build confidence. It builds energy. There's an endorphin release when you work out. Um, so once I started thinking about all of those factors in relation to moving my body, that really helped re-motivate me to um, figure out how to work within my limitations um, and helped me stay motivated after I started going back. Um, the CDC's website on their page where they talk about motivation, they have a quote that says, everyone can experience the health benefits of physical activity, age, ability, ethnicity, shape, and size do not matter. And I think it's great that they have that on there because that is extremely true. Um, there are tons of benefits and remembering those can help with regaining motivation after experiencing some differences in ability. It's also important to be able to predict barriers in advance before they become barriers. Um, some of the big ones that a lot of people note, especially with physical structured fitness, is lack of time and lack of energy. Um, and if you can prepare for whatever factors may be preventing you from physical activity, um, it can be easier to cope with them and plan um, and adjust. Um, one big thing with planning is that there is no universal plan that's going to work for everybody. Um, it's important to design a plan that's going to work for you, that's flexible and implements those smart adaptive goals that I had talked about earlier, keeping the barriers in mind that you predicted and really willing to be flexible with both your plan and with yourself as you go about that plan. Um, I'm about to jump into some different types of planning that might be relevant um, if they're not, or if they're not things that you think are applicable to your life, completely ignore them. They're, like I said, not like a one size fits all thing. They're just very general recommendations for planning um, that might help with some of the barriers. So the first one is if you either anticipate getting inadequate sleep on one night, or if you wake up and go, wow, I didn't sleep well last night, take a day off. That can be part of your plan. Um, being flexible and saying, okay, my body doesn't feel like doing what I had originally planned for. I'm going to either do a variation of my original plan or just take a rest day. That can be super important. 
Um, another thing is that researchers found that after inadequate sleep, if people participated in morning workouts instead of night workouts, they actually didn't see those adverse performance effects. So that's another thing to consider is if you don't sleep super well the night before, maybe try training in the morning um, and that can help meet performance goals, but also ensure that you're moving your body in a way that's safe. Um, if you anticipate having a long day at work or school, maybe switching up and doing things that are more related to flexibility and mobility and stability instead of things where you're using weights or really putting a lot of extra stress on your body could be a good way to plan and adapt to that challenge. Another one is weather. Um, there are days when I have a workout, I plan on going for a run outside or doing a workout outside and it rains and that might not be the safest option anymore. So planning to do an indoor workout on days when you know the weather might not be as great, or if you like running in the rain and that brings you joy saying, okay, it's raining. I'm going to switch my workout and plan for an outdoor workout because I know it's raining. Um, I think that in general is important to find joy and movement. And as you plan, allow flexibility to be able to do things that you enjoy. Um, another way to plan is cycle syncing. I talked about um, hormonal changes earlier. Cycle syncing is relatively newer. Um, everybody is different and everyone's cycle is different. So this will change based on the individual, but um, it could be beneficial to figure out what feels best for you at different stages throughout your cycle, maybe keeping a journal or a record of different changes um, and different things that feel good for you at different stages could help with planning very generally lighter training is best during your menstrual phase. So things like walking your yoga in the follicular phase, um, endurance training is optimized, um, things like running or lighter, um, weights. And then during ovulation, that's a great time for power-based training, hitting a PR, doing weightlifting, things like that. Um, and then generally in the luteal stage, aerobic exercises that are low intensity are kind of optimal. So like cycling or swimming or hiking. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's important to listen to your body and do what feels best for you. It could just be nice to notice um, some patterns throughout the month so that it might not be as discouraging if you notice that something is not necessarily as easy during one stage as during another. All of that being said, um, and I've said it again, but I do think it's important to stress there is no one size fits all approach to navigating changes in ability. It's going to differ for every single person and it'll differ even based on the day. So this is all very general. It's all based on my, my experience and the experiences of others, but it's not necessarily going to work for everybody to help them navigate the frustration of changing abilities. Um, super important to check in with yourself and to check in on your body. This is something I wish I had started doing earlier um, it's a big thing that we talk about at Clarity and a big thing that I've implemented in my life since then. Um, a very general quote, I'm not sure who the first person who said it was, but you may have heard it before. Um, if you listen to your body when it whispers, you won't have to listen when it screams. That's a really important one. I think it's extremely important to check in with yourself on a daily basis and figure out what feels good for you and what doesn't feel good and work with that and not work against it to try and do things that your body might not be in the mood to do on a particular day. Um, and seeking support is another really important one when changing your, um, or navigating your changes in ability. For me, I found a support system here at Clarity two or three years ago when I took a fitness class here, um, and noticed that it was the first time I moved my body in a way that felt safe and supportive and comfortable for me. Um, so for some of you, it might be here at Clarity for some of you, it might not be here at Clarity and that's okay too. It might be at, um, a different fitness class, or you might find support through family or friends, just anyone who can remind you to listen to your body and be flexible and be kind to yourself as you navigate changes in ability. Another big coping strategy for me when navigating that was remembering that fitness is not just structured fitness. It's not just going on a run or going to the gym. Fitness looks like a lot of different things. It can look like walking your dog or walking to a coffee shop or dancing in your kitchen. It 
you know, it doesn't need to be those structured things that we think of as fitness. And I think once you think about fitness in a way that is a little bit more flexible, that can help with navigating changes in ability because it's, it reminds you that all of these things are good. They're all beneficial. Um, and they're all versions of healthy movement. On that note, here's a quote that I love. Fitness is not just fitness. It's personal growth and mental health and therapy and transformation. It's accountability and confidence and strength and peace. It's so much more than structured fitness. And I think as a society, if we kind of move in this direction of remembering that fitness is a lot more than lifting weights or running, that will promote a healthier atmosphere around fitness and around movement. Um, lastly, I think it's really important to celebrate your body and celebrate where you're at, even with limitations or differences than before. I frequently remind myself that even though I can't do the things that I was once able to do, there are so many things that my body does allow me to do. And that's super important. And it's worth celebrating and respecting um, fluctuations within your physical ability, both in your day to day life and within your fitness journey, are completely normal. Everyone goes through them. It can be frustrating, but as long as you are supportive and listen to yourself and respect yourself, I think that's kind of the first step towards navigating those changes. Um, that's all I have, but thank you, Abby, for giving me the platform to talk about this. And thank you guys for coming and listening. Awesome. I see some, some fun energy in the chat and amazing, amazing job, Abby. I see rounds of applause, all the things. So great job. And thank you all so much for your attention and awesome questions and engagement. Um, Abby absolutely crushed it. And this will be up on YouTube in a bit, probably give me like a week, but it'll be up there. So you can definitely check out our YouTube page and forward this on to friends and family who might need the encouragement or support on how to navigate changes in different relationships with fitness. So an amazing job, Abby. And thank y'all again so much for coming out and hope to see you at future presentations. Yeah, Ooh, I also totally forgot to bring this up. Use my sources. You're the best. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Abby. Have a great night, everyone. Bye. Bye.